the following sermon by Richard Baxter is called The Causes and Danger of Slighting Christ. Matthew 22, 5, But they made light of it. What it is to make light of Christ. The blessed Son of God, who thought it not enough to die for the world, but would himself also be the preacher of grace and salvation, comprises the substance of his gospel in a parable to which the text belongs. By the king that is here said to make the marriage is met God the Father, who sent his Son into the world to cleanse men from their sins and espouse them to himself. By the king's son, for whom the marriage is made, is met the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, who took to his Godhead the nature of man, that he might be capable of being their Redeemer when they had lost themselves in sin. By the marriage is meant the uniting of Christ to the souls of sinners when he gives up himself to them to be their Savior, and they give up themselves to him as his redeemed, to be saved and ruled by him. The perfection of this marriage will be at the day of judgment when the union between Christ and his whole church shall be publicly solemnized. The word here translated marriage rather signifies a marriage feast and intimates that all men are invited by the gospel to come in and partake of Christ and salvation, even all the peculiar blessings of Christ's disciples. The invitation is from the blessed God. The servants that invite are the preachers of the gospel who are sent by God for that purpose. The preparation for the feast is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the opening a way for sinners to return to God. Second, messengers are said to be sent because God takes not the first denial, but exercises his patience till sinners are obstinate. The first person invited are the Jews, but on their obstinate refusal and being sentenced to punishment, the Gentiles are invited and graciously prevailed with to come in. The number of those that come in is so great that the house is filled with guests. Many come sincerely regarding not only the pleasure of the feast, but the honor of the marriage, not only seeking the pardon of sin and deliverance from divine wrath, but engaging themselves to Christ in all holy obedience. Some come in only for the feast without having the wedding garment. They only aim at self and not at glorifying and serving their Redeemer. These last are sentenced to everlasting misery and and perish as well as those that refuse to come in at all. For a faith that will not work is but like that of the devils, and they that expect to be pardoned and saved by such a faith are mistaken. The words of the text describe the bad entertainment which the gospel finds with many to whom it is sent, even after a first and second invitation. They make light of it and are taken up with other things. Though the Jews were the first, that were thus guilty, yet too many among us Gentiles follow them to this day. The text, in effect, declares that notwithstanding all the wonderful love and mercy God has manifested in giving his Son to be the Redeemer of the world, and his Son in giving himself, and in being a sufficient sacrifice for sin, notwithstanding all Christ's personal excellencies and the full and glorious salvation he has purchased, and all his free offers and frequent and earnest invitation to sinners, Yet many make light of and despise all this, prefer their worldly enjoyments before it. Not that all do so, or that they all continue to do so, who are once guilty of it. God is his chosen whom he will compel to come in. But till the spirit of grace overcome the obstinacy of men's hearts, they hear the gospel as a tale that is told, and the great things contained in it are disregarded. More distinctly, to illustrate the sentiments of the text, this chapter will show what it is to make light of Christ. That which carnal hearers make light of includes in it Christ himself and the blessings which he bestows. Concerning Christ himself, the gospel declares his person and nature and the great things he has done and suffered for men, his redeeming us from the wrath of God by his blood and purchasing a grant of salvation for us. The same gospel makes an offer of Christ to sinners that if they will accept him on his easy and reasonable terms, he will be their savior, the physician of their souls, their head and their husband. The blessings which Christ bestows upon sinners are the pardon of all their past sins and deliverance from the wrath of God and a sure way of obtaining pardon for all the sins they shall commit hereafter, provided they obey sincerely and turn not again to the rebellion of their unregenerate state. They shall have the Holy Spirit to be their guide and sanctifier, 
to dwell in their souls, to help them against their spiritual enemies and conform them more and more to a divine likeness, to heal their spiritual diseases and bring them back to God. They shall also have a right to everlasting glory when this life is ended, and their body shall be raised up to partake of it at the great day. Besides these, they shall have many excellent privileges and means, abundant preservation and provision in their way, and a foretaste of their future joy. All these blessings the gospel offers to them that will accept of Christ on his reasonable terms. For this is a record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. The sin of making light of Christ and salvation appears in the following instances. Number one, when men take no great heed to what the gospel declares, as if it was not a certain truth, or else was a matter that little concerned them, or as if God had not written it for them. Number two, when the gospel does not affect men or go to their hearts, but though they seem to attend to what is said, yet they are not awakened by it from their security, nor doth it in any measure excite such holy emotions in their souls as things of such everlasting consequence ought to do. We tell men what Christ has done and suffered for their souls, and it scarce moves them. We tell them of keen and cutting truths, but nothing will pierce them. We can make them hear, but cannot make them feel. Our words stop in the porch of their ears and fancies, but enter not into their inward parts. It is as if we spake to men that have not hearts. Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed, gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and Christ should heal them. Number three, men make light of Christ when they have no high esteem for him and salvation by him, but whatsoever they may say with their tongues, or may speculatively believe, yet in their serious and practical thoughts they have a higher esteem for the things of this world than they have for Christ and the salvation he has purchased. It is despising Christ to account his doctrine by the question of words and names, like Gallio, or a superstition of one Jesus which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive, like Festus, or to ask the preachers of the gospel as the Athenians did, what will this babbler say? Men make light of Christ when being informed of the truths of the gospel, on what terms Christ and his blessings may be had, how it is the will of God they should believe and accept the offer, and how he commands them to do it upon pain of damnation, and yet they will not consent unless they could have Christ on terms on their own. They will not part with their portion in this world, nor lay down their pleasures, profits, and honors at the feet of Jesus to be content to take only so much of them back as is consistent with his will and interest, but think it is a hard saying to be resolved to forsake all for Christ. Tis a high contempt of Christ and everlasting life when men have their part in him, if they would, but they will not unless they may keep the world too and are resolved to please their flesh whatever be the consequence. It is also a making light of Christ and salvation when men will promise fair and profess their willingness to have Christ upon his own terms and to forsake all for him, but they nevertheless cleave to the world and to their sinful courses, nor will suffer their practice to be changed by all that Christ has done or said. This is the sin of making light of Christ and salvation. Chapter 2 thy Christ is made so light of. It may seem a wonder that ever men who have the use of their reason should be so foolish as to make light of things of infinite importance. But the causes are such as these. Number one, some men understand not the meaning of the words in which the gospel is expressed, and how can they value what they do not understand? Though we speak to them as plainly as we can, yet they have so estranged themselves from God and the concerns of their souls that they know not what we say. It is with them as if God in just judgment had said, With stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people. Number two. Some understand the words we speak, but not the matter, because they are carnal. For the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 
The things of the Spirit are not well known by bare report, but by spiritual taste, which none have but those that are taught by the Spirit, which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Number three. Carnal minds apprehend not a suitableness in these spiritual and heavenly things, and therefore set light by them. Tell them of everlasting glory, and they hear you as if you were persuading them to go and play with the sun. The affairs of another world are out of their element, and therefore they have no more delight in them than a fish would have in the pleasantest meadow, or a swine in a jewel. They that are after the Spirit may mind the things of the Spirit, but they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Number four. The chief cause of slighting Christ and salvation is a secret root of unbelief. Whatsoever men may pretend, they do not really believe the word of God. They are taught in general to say the gospel is true, but they never saw the evidence of its truth so as to be firmly persuaded of it nor have they got their soul settled on the infallibility of God's testimony, nor have they considered the truth of the particular doctrines revealed in Scripture. O sinners, did you but really believe the gospel account of the evil of sin, of your need of Christ, and what he has done for you, and what you must be and do? If ever you are saved by him, and what will become of you forever if you remain in disobedience? I dare say this would cure the contempt of Christ, and you would not make so light of your own salvation. But men do not believe, while they say so, and even while they themselves think so. There is in them an evil heart of unbelief, which makes them depart from the living God. Tell any man he shall have a gift of ten thousand pounds, if he will but go some miles for it. If he believes you, he will go. If he believes not, he will not go. And if he will not go, suppose that he is physically able, you may be sure he does not believe. I know a slight belief may consist with a wicked life, but a sincere belief is inconsistent with so great a neglect of the things that are believed. Number five. Christ and salvation are made light of because of men's hardness of heart. The heart is naturally hard and grows harder by custom and sin, especially by long abuse of mercy neglect of the means of grace, and resisting the spirit of grace. Hence it is that men are turned into such stones. Until God cured them of the stone in the heart, no wonder if they feel not what they know, nor regard what preachers say, but make light of it. Tis hard preaching a stone into tears, or making a rock to tremble. When men's hearts are like the highway that is trodden to hardness, or like the clay that is hardened in the fire, when no mercies can melt them to repentance, when they have consciences seared with a hot iron, then it is no wonder if they be past feeling and work all uncleanness with greediness so as to make light of Christ and everlasting glory. Oh, that this were not the case of too many of our hearers. Had we but living souls to speak to, they would hear and feel and not make light of what we say. I know they are naturally alive, but they are dead in trespasses and sins. Were there but one spark of the life of grace in them, the doctrine of salvation by Jesus Christ would appear to them to be the weightiest business in the world. Oh, how confident should I be to prevail with men, to mind the concerns of eternity more than time, if they had but life and sense and reason. How deplorable is the condition of their souls who are fallen under the fearful judgment of spiritual deadness and blindness and hardness of heart. Number six. Multitudes make light of Christ and salvation because they are wholly sensual. The concerns of another world are out of sight and so far from their senses that they cannot regard them. But present things are in their eyes and in their hands. There must be a living faith to prevail over sense before unseen things will be duly regarded. Sense works with great advantage and therefore powerfully opposes faith. Where faith itself is found, and no wonder if it carries all before it, where there is no true and living faith to resist it and to lead the soul to higher things. They, in the text, who made light of Christ and salvation, went their ways as it is added one to his farm, another to his merchandise. Men have houses and lands to look after, a wife and children, body and outward estate, and therefore they forget that they have a God, a Redeemer, a soul to mind. These worldly things are near at hand and therefore work naturally and forcibly. But the other are thought to be a great way off, and therefore too distant to work on their affections. 
their bodies have life and sense, and therefore, if they want meat or drink or clothes, will feel their wants and make them known and never rest till they are supplied. Men cannot make light of their bodily necessities, but their souls being spiritually dead are insensible of their wants and will therefore be as quiet when starving and languishing to destruction as if all were well and nothing ailed them. Thus poor people are so attentive to their bodily wants as if they had nothing else to mind, having their trade and callings to follow, and so much to do from morning to night. They can find no tune for Christ and salvation. Jesus would teach them, but they have no leisure to hear him. The Bible is before them, but they cannot spare time to read it. A minister is in the town with them, but they cannot go to ask him, What must we do to be saved? And when they do hear, their hearts are so full of the world, they cannot mind what they hear, nor is there any room to pour into them the waters of life. The cares of the world choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. No man can serve two masters, God and mammon. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Men will set light by Christ and salvation while they so highly value any things upon earth. This is a ruin of many thousand souls. It would grieve the heart of any serious Christian to see how eagerly this vain world is everywhere followed, and a world that come neglected. To compare the care men take for the world with the care of their souls, and the time they spend about the world with the time they employ for their salvation. To see how the world feels their mouths, their hands, their houses, their hearts, while Christ hath little more than a bare title of respect. To come into their company and hear no discourse but of the world. To come into their houses and hear and see nothing but for the world, as if this world would last forever, or would purchase them another. If I ask the ministers of the gospel how their labors succeed, they tell me people continue still the same, and give up themselves wholly to the world, so that they mind not what we say to them, nor will give a full entertainment to the word, and all because of the deluding world. I know that too many ministers themselves did not make light of that Christ whom they preach, through being drawn away by the love of this world. In a word, men of a worldly disposition judge of things according to worldly advantages. Thus Christ is despised and rejected of men. They hide, as it were, their faces from him, and esteem him not. They see no form, nor comeliness, nor beauty that they should desire him. Number seven. In consideration is another cause why men make light of Christ. They do not soberly attend to the truth and importance of soul concerns. They suffer not their minds to dwell so long upon them till they procure a due esteem and deeply affect their hearts. If these things are assented to but not closely considered, how should they have their proper influence? While men have reason given them to think and consider of the things that most concern them, and yet they will not see it, this occasions their making light of such things and treating them with contempt. Number eight. Christ and salvation are made light of because men remain insensible of their sin and misery. Their eyes were never open to see themselves as they are, nor their hearts truly humbled in the sense of their own wretchedness. If this were done, they would soon be brought to value a Savior. A heart broken for sin can no more make light of Christ and salvation than a hungry man of his food or a sick man of his physician. When sin and guilt are groaned under as an intolerable burden, then nothing will serve the turn but Christ. Till men are deeply humbled, they can part with Christ in salvation for a lust, for a little worldly gain, for that which is less than nothing. But when God hath enlightened their consciences and broken their hearts, then they would give a world for Christ. Then they count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus their Lord. When they are once pricked in their hearts for their sin and misery, then they cry out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? When they are awakened by the word or providence of God, then they will ask with the jailer, Sirs, what must we do to be saved? Thus God will bring men low by humiliation before he brings them to salvation. Number 9. Men take occasion to make light of Christ because the gospel has grown common to them. They hear of it every day, and the frequency dulls their affections. Were it a rarity, it might be more regarded, but now they plead, We have these things every day. They make not light of their meat and drink, their health or life, because they possess them every day. They make not light of the sun, because it shines every day. At least they should not, for the mercy is the greater by its constancy, 
Yet Christ and salvation are made light of because they hear of them often. Pearls are trod in the dirt where they are common. The heavenly man is counted dry. The full soul loatheth and honeycomb. But to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. Number 10. Christ is made light of either because men think he is theirs already or because he may easily be theirs at any time. It is true that grace is free and the offer is universal wherever the gospel is preached. And it is true that men may have Christ whenever they are willing to comply with his terms. But if you are not willing now, how can you think you shall be willing hereafter? If you can make your own heart willing, why not do it immediately? Can you do it better when sin hath more hardened it and God may have given you over to yourself? O oh, sinners, you might do much, though you were not able of yourselves to come in. If you would but now subject yourself to the working of the Spirit and set in while the gales of grace continue, did you know what a hard thing it is to be so much as willing to have Christ in grace when the heart is given up to its own corrupt bias and the Spirit has withdrawn its former influences? You would not be so confident of your own strength to believe and repent, nor would you from such foolish confidence continue to make light of Christ. If indeed it be so easy a manner as you imagine for a sinner to believe and repent at any time, how comes it to pass that it is done by so few, while multitudes perish in their impenitence amidst all desirable helps and means? It must be allowed that the thing is very reasonable and easy in itself to pure nature, but while man is spiritually blind and dead, the things are scarcely possible to him, which are ever so easy to others. To gracious souls, it is the easiest and sweetest life in the world to live in the love of God and the thoughts of that life to come, where all their hope and happiness lies, but it is as easy to remove mountains as to bring carnal hearts to this. These men, however, condemn themselves, for if they think it so easy a matter to repent and believe, and so have Christ in salvation, they have then the less excuse for neglecting what they thought so easy. O oh, miserable, impenitent souls, what think you to reply when God shall ask you, Why did you not repent and love your Redeemer above the world, when you have imagined you could easily do it at any time? Are such as these the causes why multitudes make light of Christ and salvation? How great, then, is the folly, and how contemptible are the judgments of all carnal men, and how little need have we to be discouraged by their sneers or insults. That man must be foolish or mad that knows no difference between dirt and gold, and it is the height of folly and madness to set light by Christ and salvation and be daily toiling for the dirt of this world. And yet how lamentably prone are many weak persons to be ashamed of godliness, if such fools or madmen do but deride them for it, and to think hardly of a holy life, if such as these do but rail at it. On the contrary, if you perceive any setting light by Christ and salvation, let their wisdom and words be light in your esteem, and hear their reproaches of a holy life with the tender compassion with which you would hear the ravings of a madman. Are the best ministers of the gospel despised, and do they complain of the ill success of their labors? Wonder not, since the ministry of apostles succeeded no better, though they had miracles to second their doctrines. If any preachers could have shaken and torn in pieces the hearts of sinners, they could have done it. And if any could have made all cry out, as some did, what shall we do? It would have been the apostles. It is not, therefore, for want of good preachers that men make light of Christ and salvation. The first news of pardon for sin and the hope of glory and the danger of everlasting misery would turn the hearts of men within them, if they were as tractable in spiritual manners as in temporal. But alas, it is far otherwise. Let it not seem strange to ministers, nor let them be too much discouraged by it, if when they have said all that they can desire in order to win the hearts of men to Christ, the greatest part still slight them. And though they bow the knee to him and honor him with their lips, yet basely prefer every worldly and carnal pleasure or profit before him. While it is thus with many, blessed be God, it is not thus with all. But before we that are ministers inquire after this great condemning sin amongst our hearers, we should take care that we be not guilty of it ourselves. God forbid that having undertaken the sacred office of revealing the excellencies of Christ to the world, we should make light of him ourselves and slight that salvation which we daily preach. 
the Lord knows we are all of us so defective in our esteem for Christ and do our work so negligently that we have reason to be ashamed of our best sermons. But should this sin prevail in us, we are of all men most miserable. I love not censoriousness, brethren, yet I dare not befriend so vile a sin in myself or others under pretense of avoiding it, especially when there is so great a necessity first to heal it in us, who make it our business to heal it in others. Oh, that there were no cause to complain that Christ is made light of by those that preach him. Are not studies neglected? Are not ministrations lifeless and formal? How little is done out of the pulpit for reproving sin and saving men's souls? Is there not a perpetual neglect of those things in which the interest of Christ consists? Even the healing, reforming, and enlarging his churches are not many made preachers before they are Christians, and therefore by their own covetous and worldly lives lose the most precious advantages for doing good to souls? If such ministers believe the scriptures which they preach, methinks their studying and preaching should fill them with terror. This has been a reading of The Causes and Danger of Sliding Christ by Richard Baxter. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.